I came across a tweet from a friend of mine the other day that talked about paper parks, marine protected areas, what goes on in paper parks compared to marine protected areas, and what is not supposed to go on in a marine protected area. So I'm going to go over that today's ep- in today's episode of Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast because I think it's important that people realize what the difference is between the different types of quote-unquote marine protected areas and what people consider as that and what should be a marine protected area. We're going to talk about that on today's episode of Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. Let's start the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Luna. In today's episode, we're going to talk about marine protected areas and parks and ocean parks and protections in the ocean. Uh, I think it's really great that we kind of touch base on this. I, I love to talk about MPAs. My graduate work, as many of you know, was in marine protected areas. I've always wanted to continue into marine protected areas. I'm part of an organization. I sit on the board of an organization that deals with uh, planning and protection a- protected areas, but really, you know, linking science to um, uh, to policy and in terms of protections and and strategies and so forth. Um, and that's called PACMARA, the Pacific Marine Analysis and Research, Pacific Marine Research and Analysis uh, Organization. And it's a great, like, it, it's great to talk about, but it can get very confusing. You know, we hear a lot of different terms like paper parks. We hear a lot of different terms like uh, marine protected areas, uh, marine sanctuaries, um, you know, marine conservation areas here in Canada. And you just kind of like, well, what, where, where does that all fit in? Aren't they all marine protected areas? And a lot of times they all get lumped up as MPAs. And now there's a specific definition of an MPA. It's been happening for the last like three years, <clears throat> excuse me, three years or so. But you know, we really need to kind of hone in on like what is a true marine protected area and what is considered like a paper park and what's the difference and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about that on today's episode. Uh, so that's let's let's just get into it. So my friend Angelo Villa Gomez, who, you know, great friend of mine, uh, I, I, I consider him like a brother of mine. Uh, we get along really well. And he has great tweets, he has great thought provoking tweets. They may not go like completely viral. Uh, but you know, they definitely make you, make you think. And he was retweeting and quoted a retweet of, uh, an Oceana in Europe, uh, Twitter account, which I believe is, uh, at Oceana Europe, like all one word. And, uh, which makes sense. <laughs> um, he, he said like, so the, the actual, uh, tweet that Oceana put out was breaking new report on paper parks reveals shocking data about trawling in Spanish marine protected areas hashtag MPAs, and it had a link to uh, an article on their Spanish Oceana website, which unfortunately I couldn't read because it was all in Spanish and there was no translation button, which is fine. It's a Spanish website. Um, And it said on the bottom, it said 404 trawlers operated inside hashtag Natura 2000 in 2020. I assume Natura 2000 is a protected area. Uh, A risky game while hashtag climate uh, and hashtag biodiversity crisis grows. Uh, is that even legal? And then it asks Europe environment. So, you know, these are obviously, it's it's an interesting tweet. Um, obviously, having trawling happen within any kind of park is counterproductive. Trawling can be very uh, disastrous for habitat along the bottom uh, of the of the ocean and can destroy habitat. So long term, it's, it's not that great. Um, and so Angelo, you know, put up a, a tweet saying, hey, I disagree with the Oceana's uh, use of quote unquote paper park. Uh, here. Um, He said, a paper park is one which is well designed, but poorly implemented. An MPA that allows trawling is poorly designed and is not even uh, even protected on paper. And no amount of implementation will lead to benefits for nature. And what he means by that, and I know Angelo very well, because we've had so many discussions about MPAs, trawling or any kind of extractive, uh, extractive activity should not happen within an MPA. An MPA by definition, and this is by like a UN definition that was that was put together by the UN, by IUCN, uh, by a number of different organizations, including the Marine Conservation Network. Uh, Pew had a say in it. Uh, they had a con- they had like a, a big say. They had a, a control over it. And so the, the new definition is an MPA is in se- in a sense a res- what used to be considered a reserve where nothing else would happen in there. Uh, not even science, maybe not even scientific um, discovery or scientific study. It would just no extractive activity right, to disturb that MPA. That is what is considered a marine 
protected area. And I know if I got that wrong, uh, Angela is going to tell me if I got it wrong. So, so we'll know if I'll have to correct myself on the next episode or an episode after that. But, um, you know, no extractive activity should happen in a marine protected area. Now, a paper park, what he says, is one that's well designed but poorly implemented. So a paper park is really something that has been designated as a a specific park. And I'll talk about that in a second, but is not enforced or not implemented at all. There's, there's really no only partially or, or enforced or implemented, not really managed very well. So it's not actually done in real life. It's just on paper. And so a lot of people call them paper parks. Now, a lot of people confuse marine protected areas with paper parks, uh, and a paper park could be a, a designed MPA, but nothing is enforced or nothing is actually implemented or managed. So extractive activities could be happening within there. Um, and so I, it just this tweet really made me think to say, well, hold on a second. Let's, you know, the audience hears, you know, you guys hear all this stuff and read all this stuff online about parks, about marine protected areas, how important they are. Um, but governments have, and this is all over the world, governments have various levels of protection and they're all designated and implemented differently. But they tend, a lot of the governments tend to say, hey, this is what, you know, we're contributing to biodiversity or, or to protecting biodiversity or con- uh, contributing to managing fisheries and continue contributing to like international agreements because a lot of the people that are reading or listening to this type of news maybe not realize that there are different designations and not all parks are MPAs, right? And so that could be very confusing. And it was even confusing when I, you know, started to learn about all these when I was doing my graduate work, that there are different levels of classification, you know? So like a marine conservation area in Canada that was designated by Parks Canada, federal government, is not considered an MPA because certain activities can happen in there. And so they're, it's not really now, the, under the new definition, a marine protected area. And even then, back in 1997, when Canada started the Oceans Act or implemented the Oceans Act, you know, it said that the fisheries and oceans can actually designate marine protected areas. But oil and gas extraction could always happen in those marine protected areas. And it wasn't until recently that Canada decided to say, hey, actually nothing can happen in marine protected areas because that... Because the marine protected areas um, had a new definition. And Canada had to abide by that if they wanted to contribute to the 30 by 30. Right? Because just up until about eight years ago, or not even, six years ago, Canada only had like 1% of its oceans protected. And the goal was to have, you know, by before this 30 by 30 was to have 20%. And so the federal government f- from then on went, okay, we're going to go from 1% to 15%. In, our, in the next four years, they did that. And now they I think they're over 20% now or close to 20% now, but don't quote me on that. And they're continuing to try and get it 30 by 30, you know, you know, by 2030, 30% by 2030. And so, uh, so, but there, but it gets really confusing. Like even the US, and I'm not quite familiar, familiar right now with the vernacular of what is considered an MPA because there's marine sanctuaries, there are, there are federally protected areas, there are state protected areas, and certain activities can happen within those protected areas um so they could be parks or a sanctuary but they may not be by definition a marine protected area and i think that's really important when we start considering all of the stuff that can happen within a marine protected area right uh so it's it's something that we need to consider when we read the all the stuff that's being what's being protected What's being protected actually as a marine protected area? Is, is there fishing allowed in there? Is there um, oil and gas extraction allowed in there or exploration allowed in there? Because you got to think, you know, one thing that not a lot of people consider, and I didn't consider this until I found out like 20 years ago, was that the government, and this is going to happen, I think it's happened in the U.S. and in Canada, but definitely happened in Canada, but the government have leased out a while ago, they leased out to oil and gas companies these plots of where they can explore. And and those plots may not have been in the ocean, may not have been explored yet. And they may never be explored, but they are lease sites that the oil and gas and these oil and gas companies pay the government of Canada for just to hold them under their property. 
just in case they ever want to extract it or explore it. I think exploring would happen before, but extract it. And so they may know something that another company doesn't know or the government doesn't know, but they may know something that they want to, they want to do in there later on. Well, all of a sudden, if a marine protected area or a protected area gets actually designated there, by law, at one point, I don't know if this has changed, but at one point, the government of Canada couldn't instill a full marine protected area because the oil and gas company still had a lease within that area. If the protected area, you know, enclosed that that bottom of the ocean there. So it's always been interesting. And in fact, in Canada, some of the uh, arguments between the federal and provincial governments have happened on the West Coast uh, over marine protected areas and whether a marine protected area could actually go into a place. And it happened because there was an, uh, the, like the, at this point, at that, at that point, it was the uh, province of British Columbia and the federal government that had an argument of who is looking after, like who controls, who has jurisdiction over the ocean bottom and over the water column. And so they were arguing about that, but the, a lot of the nonprofit organizations, NGOs, wanted that area protected because it was an important environmental area, ecological area. But the governments wouldn't implement it because they didn't know who was looking after which. The government of Canada wanted access to the bottom of that water body, uh, but the, the province said, no, this is ours under this, under this district jurisdiction. They argued about it for, for years. And so a marine protected area couldn't be designated because of it. So a lot of this stuff goes on. Uh, in whether it be a marine conservation area or whoever designates it, you really have to be careful of how protected an area is based on which department or which level of government designates it and how it's designated. What's it called? What's the actual official title? They'll have a name for the protected area, but the official title or what category it falls under could be different. And that needs to be addressed. That definitely needs to be addressed. So, uh, yeah, I just thought it was super interesting. A, a tweet really made me think just as much. Angela always makes me think about these types of things, and he's definitely an inspiration. So if you want to follow him, you can go follow him. It's at Tao Tao Tassi, which is T-A-O-T-A-O-T-A-S-I. I highly recommend uh, you follow him. He just got a new job. And uh, he's definitely going to be providing more of these. Uh, what he continues to do is provide more of these thought-provoking tweets. So check that out. Uh, that's all I have for today. I just wanted to kind of just give you a basis of what these MPAs or these parks actually mean. Um, and, you know, why we call certain parks paper parks, why we call certain MPAs MPAs when they may not be MPAs, and what their categories actually are. So if you're in a different country than me, like not in Canada, or even if you are in Canada, look up the different categories of, of parks. And if you're in the US, if you're in Spain, if you're in the UK, Australia, Italy, wherever you are, look up the different categories they have for protected areas and find out which one's an actual MPA and find out how many actual MPAs and what percentage of the ocean that they actually cover in your jurisdiction. Love to hear from you. Uh, you can uh, you can get in touch with me a number of different ways. Let's go with Instagram today, at Speak Up for Blue. You can message me. I'd love to hear from you on that. Uh, you can also go to speakupforblue.com, which is our network site, where we have a lot of other podcasts on marine conservation and science in general. Uh, but you can leave me a voicemail. You can go to the bottom right corner, leave me a voicemail. Just click on that microphone, and, and if you have you want to have your say on MPAs, please do. I'll play it on the web, on the on the uh, on the next episode, or the next couple of episodes, and you can uh, you can let me know if you want that to happen or you don't want that to happen. You can also email me. Uh, just click the contact information. That email goes right to me, and I'd be more than happy to have a discussion with you, follow up with you, or even cover that on an episode. Anyway, because uh, that, that's what I want to do. I want to generate a conversation. And that's what this podcast is all about. But that's today's episode. I want to thank you so much for listening and for participating. If you want to participate later on, more than happy, you can contact me through those means. And uh, I want to say thank you so much for listening to this episode of Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lewin. I don't know what's wrong with my voice today. I hope I'm not getting sick. I hope, def definitely not COVID, hopefully. Uh, but <laughs> that's it for today's episode. Have a great day and happy conservation. <laughs> <laughs>